At long last, it is time! Welcome to Halloween in July, the celebration of spookies. To celebrate our spooky games, I've discounted the yearly rate on my Patreon as low as it'll allow me to set it. So you can get a whole year of early access to videos, Discord access, all the recipes and 4K cat clips your heart desires, and you'll be helping me make more videos too. And to sweeten this deal even further, all the yearly pledges get their own Iron On anti-content patch, and any Anyone who pledges yearly at the $5 tier or higher gets their own special patron apron just like the one I wear in cooking segments. I finally found a way to work 0451 into the design like so many of you have asked. We're gonna do something different this year. The phenomenon known as mascot horror has been going on for quite some time in the gaming world. While many of these games are very, very popular and very successful, often spinning off into franchises with tons of sequels, companion books, or even full-blown television shows and movies, they're not always looked on with adoration and praise, and frankly some people outright scoff at the very notion of them. Now, I'm not completely blind here. I'm well aware that a lot of these games have some legitimate criticisms against them, particularly that they can made as bait for lore channels, or that they sometimes tend to be low effort. Heck, I'll admit that I've seen my own fair share of mascot horror lore videos to games I never even thought I was going to be playing, but I am ignoring all of that. We are going to delve into the depths of mascot horror this month with what's called the beginner's mindset. We are going to take everything as it is presented with these games with no preconceptions and and then we'll rate these games not based on their expanded universe lore or how much our nephews talk about them, but how they are as games and how I enjoyed them. There's gotta be a reason why some of these got to be so popular, and we aren't gonna find out if we wear the blinders of preconception. One last thing, we're not really gonna make any attempts to define what exactly a mascot horror is. Trust me as a guy who spent years trying to define another nebulous at best niche genre, it just doesn't go well. Today we're going to take a look at Bendy and the Ink Machine, and spoiler alert, I actually really like this one. The character designs are well done and memorable, the gameplay starts out a bit simplistic at first, but as you get deeper into the game the later episodes have a lot more to do, and it's an overall well paced, aesthetically pleasing game. On the note of the latter, it looks really nice and you can tell that the Meatly et al at Joey Drew Studios, the developer of this game, love that early 20th century rubber hose style animation. So I have the luxury of being in the present day and being able to play Bendy all in one go. Although, on a more literal sense, it took me a few sessions. Bendy was originally an episodic game, though. According to some behind-the-scenes stuff, Bendy was initially an experiment in combining 2D art with a 3D game world. This went so well that they made a full five episodes, and there's plenty of cute fan art in the credits, so things were even going well as things went along. The upshot is that Bendy had a fleshed-out story with a satisfying ending. The downside, the first two episodes are a little rough. Heck, episode 3 has moments where it sort of outstays its welcome, but I still think that's where the game starts getting good. How this breaks down is that from a gameplay perspective, episode 1 is very light on mechanics, with it arguably being about on par with Slender the Eight Pages. And if anything, episode 1 is more of an aesthetic experiment than an intro to a game. Once you get into episode 2, you'll face enemies, do puzzles that hit that sweet spot where they're not walkthrough bait, but they'll still tickle your brain just enough, and generally be soaking in Joey Drew Studios. The episodes generally have an upward trajectory, with my personal favorite being episode 4. It feels like Joey Drew, the game dev, was starting to really get confident with their game development skills and wanted to make something really cool. Bendy strikes a nice balance between having the player characters be defenseless and having to hide from enemies versus having something to give the bad guys a good whack with. It's nice that you aren't doing the same thing all the time, and even if you're just sort of moving back and forth between these two, it's good to mix things up. There are even boss fights later on in the game that are pretty good too. A lot of it is going to be along the lines of, uh, oh hey, you have to go to place and collect number of things, but it's it's not so much the objective you're enjoying, but just how everything is laid out and the monsters you face. And depending on the scenario, you're either going to need to hide from those dudes or strategically take dudes on because just because you found a weapon does not mean you are suddenly Master Chief. Sometimes you'll even find yourself up against enemies that you were able to just smack in the head before with your little pipe, but you're without a weapon right now so you just gotta run and hide. So I guess it'd be prudent to go over the mascot for these mascot horror games, and personally I think that Bendy and the Ink Demon are top tier. Let's start with Bendy because look at this little guy. 
I love Bendy. It is design is simple and easy to recognize. You can immediately tell what he's inspired by. And he very much seems like he's just a cute little guy that's made to star in short animation films of the early 20th century. It's a shame that we don't see a whole lot of Bendy in person during the game. The Ink Demon, however. The Ink Demon very much feels inspired by Alien Isolation's Xenomorph. There is a lot of hints that it's around before its initial appearance in Episode 1, and it follows a similar, albeit more relaxed, set of rules. The more noise you make, the more likely the Ink Demon is to show up, which includes running, excessive attacking, and just generally being rude. You can't fight the Ink Demon, and it's probably not a good idea to try and outrun it. Running into the nearest confession booth or other thing to hide in isn't the only answer, though. You can actually avoid the Ink Demon encounters entirely by 1. Walking calmly from one objective to another, and 2. If you do see the telltale ink splotches on the walls, you can actually slowly back away and avoid that area for maybe a minute. And while I'm not sure if he does or does not spawn, you won't have to directly confront him or run and hide. You'll have to deal with this guy eventually, but we've got some other antagonists we need to confront first. Mascot horror is horror, so let's take a sec to check out them spookies. Much like the gameplay, the first couple episodes are very much in the early stages of what Joey Drew had done as a studio, and the scares are rather lowbrow at least in episode one. Episode two isn't so much super spooky as it is setting out to establish characters and some more world building so that we can really have fun in the later episodes. Like two has its moments, but it feels more like a way for Joey Drew, the game studio to stretch their legs and build out the mechanics so that we can go hard later on in episode four. Before we leave the first couple chapters though, this particular moment in chapter two goes pretty hard. I said, can I get an amen? Once Joey Drew Studios got their feet under them, the main spookies of chapters 3 to 5 are much more along the lines of classic Disney, or perhaps more appropriately, classic rubber hose turned spooky. The earlier episodes had the Ink Demon and these little sluggy guys here, called Seekers, but while they're certainly not friendly little bunnies, they aren't particularly frightening up front when they're attacking you. It's more when they get the drop on you, which admittedly they do get quite a few times, and after a while you'll be checking puddles of ink for ripples to see if something's planning to jump out at you. The main enemies you'll be facing after the Seekers are the Wrecker Gang. I, I believe that's what they're called. These dudes are very much spooky versions of old cartoon characters made by the in-world Joey Drew Studios, and are tanky enough that one of them is to be taken seriously, and two or more means you're going to need to get creative with your movement. The Seekers will come back later on in a more of a threatening form, but the Wreckers are going to be your bread and butter enemies, who will not only be fighting, but also so hiding from because, well, you aren't always going to have a weapon handy. Where Bendy really shines are the unique enemies. The Ink Demon, the Projectionist, Alice and Sammy. Bendy in the Ink Machine is very much an ensemble cast of creatures. It very much follows the theme of each major area having a big bad with some intersection between baddies who all share a theme of being some kind of animation production process. A deranged composer. A guy that's on the technical side of things that's never around when you need him. The talent that's letting things go to her head. Oh yeah, and the personification of all the little evils needed to make something as passion-driven as animation all fused together into one monstrous bad that you cannot truly fight. While some of these guys are recurring, you're never dealing with one of them for too long, and they tend to have a way of coming back when it's most plot-relevant. I think my favorite thing about Bendy and the Ink Machine's spookies is the creative use of low color in the game's aesthetic. If you somehow haven't noticed yet, Bendy uses a color scheme where everything is either ink black or that not-quite-sepia yellow of faded paper. Aside from a certain scene we won't get into yet, we won't even see any color until the next game. The two-tone world of Bendy and the Ink Machine does a great job of making it feel like the ink is swallowing the world whole as you go deeper and deeper into the bowels of this suspiciously labyrinthine animation studio. It pulls in hallways and prevents entire sections of the studio from being accessed until you find a way to drain it. The ink is always present, and that means the ink demon is always around too, so watch your back.
time to do what we do for this channel and have a cooking segment. So this one felt pretty obvious to me. Let's do bacon soup. It's the big collectible in Bendy and the Ink Machine and seems like a pretty good idea. Like a potato soup, except instead of potatoes being the dominant thing, it's bacon, which sounds pretty good. I started doing research on this by taking a look at the end game model and then trying to take a peek into the pot and Boris's little hideout to some avail. And then when I went to check the wiki to see if there was any flavor text I missed and there was a whole recipe already there. Well, that's no fun. We're gonna reverse engineer this anyway and make my version of bacon soup. The main differences here is that, like some of the flavor text says, we're going to be using a vegetable stock and we're going to be using a special kind of bacon instead of Canadian bacon. I think this recipe also does a bechamel, like I'm planning to do here, but based on the instructions, it does it in an unconventional way by making the roux and then adding the rest of the soup to it before the cream. We're gonna go about that in the traditional way. While whoever posted this recipe did leave instructions, which I think it comes from some sort of companion book, they're rather vague and skip entire parts of the cooking process. I think even if I did try to follow this recipe, I'd end up having to fill in a lot of blanks anyway. So, like I just said, I saw the flavor text for bacon soup in game says it's a vegetable broth, which confuses me as to why this wiki version uses chicken broth, but maybe they wanted to get more flavor in the soup, maybe that's just what they use for everything, uh, I don't know. Regardless, before we start our broth, we're gonna prep our bacon. Now, the special bacon I'm going to use, it's what's called steak cut bacon, or bacon steak. It's basically just normal bacon, except the slicer at the deli is set as wide as can be reasonably set. This stuff is actually about the same price or sometimes even cheaper than normal bacon you'd buy vacuum sealed out of the fridge at the store. And if you don't see it in your meat section or at the butcher counter, most butchers or deli clerks will gladly slice it extra thick for you if you just ask. Now, before we start our veggie stock, we are getting our money's worth out of this bacon. We're gonna fry it up low and slow on a nonstick pan in order to slowly render out all that bacon fat while not accidentally making the bacon too crispy, as the label specifically says it's soft bacon in bacon soup. You might have a few oopsies here, especially if you haven't used steak cut bacon before, but you should be fine after two or three batches. Don't feel too bummed out if you have some oopsies here and there. As you cook the bacon, remove the browned but still fairly chewy strips to a wire rack to dry and make sure that you're reserving the rendered fat to these heat resistant containers like the little ramekins I've got here between every batch of bacon. Not only will this make sure our bacon is pan fried and not deep fried, but we're gonna need a good bit of that grease in just a sec. Once all the bacon is done and that grease is set aside, we're gonna start cutting up our vegetables for stock. Nothing crazy here. Just some celery, yellow onion, garlic, a couple carrots if you like carrots, and seasonings like salt. Now before we put everything into the pot, we're gonna take out our onions and celery and cook them in half of our reserve bacon fat on medium low in a high walled saucepan. This is another major deviation as while we will use butter later on for the bechamel, there's no reason to be sweating the veggies in anything other than bacon fat when we got it right here. Oh, and add the carrots too if you're a fan of carrots. I personally, I had to remind myself to add them to give it authenticity to the recipe, but I kind of tend to avoid them. I don't know why, I got nothing against carrots. I just don't like the sweetness in my broth. I like savory broths. We want to give this maybe 15 to 20 minutes tops as we don't want to caramelize the onion before carefully transferring it all into that big old pot to cook low and slow with a good deal of water, the garlic bulbs, and our spices for like two, three, maybe four hours depending on uh, what you're doing and if this is on a weekend or not. Cooking's kind of more vibes than science. But while that's going, we can get everything else done. Get yourself a sizable bowl and fill it halfway with water you'd be willing to drink from a glass. Start peeling your potatoes and then dicing them into small cubes about the size of those little D6s you use for Warhammer or a little smaller than a four-studded Lego. Chunky things for soup should be big enough to where you're rather pleased with yourself when you get those nice chunks in your spoon, but small enough to where three or four of them can fit on that spoon with plenty of liquid in between. Put your cube potatoes into the water and let osmosis sap out the excess starches from the potatoes. Maybe give it a little stir once all the potatoes are in. And then we're gonna take our bacon we just cooked and take advantage of how thick it is to cube it up into smaller pieces that will fit perfectly between the chunks of potatoes for maximum efficiency souping. Once all your bacon is cubed, put it in a bowl and move it to the fridge since it's gonna be a while before our 
broth is ready to go, and we don't want our bacon sitting in the temperature danger zone for that long. Change out the waters on the potatoes, give them another stir, and put them in the fridge too. Now that everything's underway, we've still got some time to kill on that stock, so it would be an excellent time to maybe clean up all the parts of your kitchen that don't have an active flame on them right now, and maybe check the dates on your sauces and seasonings. When was the last time you did that anyway? Okay, that stock or broth looks stock-like. Put a pasta strainer over a somewhat smaller but still pretty large pot in your sink and very carefully transfer your cooked stock into it while catching all the solids in the strainer. Look at that, we've got our own homemade veggie stock for bacon soup. Make sure there's more than enough room to add everything else later and let's get our last bit of prep done. We're gonna dice up just a bit more celery and carrots before adding them in the drained potatoes back into that high walled saucepan and cooking those in the rest of the bacon fat for about 15 to 20 minutes. Remember we want it just low enough to soften them up, but not thoroughly cook them. While that's going on, take a look at your new broth and give it a little taste. If it's a little too fatty for you to tell how it tastes from all the bacon grease, use a ladle to gently skim the excess off the top, and then it should be a little easier. Now, see if it needs more salt, more seasonings, or anything like that, but if you season beforehand, it shouldn't be in need of anything. Then, once all the veggies are done softening up, carefully transfer them into the big pot, go get your bacon, and add that too. We're gonna set this to cook on medium low for another 10 to 15 minutes, and while that's going on, we're gonna make our bechamel. Now, I know that sounds like an intimidating thing because it's a fancy French word, but it's literally just melting butter in a high-walled saucepan, sifting in the flour, and mixing it until it becomes a thick paste. And then, when it's a thick paste, we slowly start adding in creamer, which we're using a half and half, and stirring it until it becomes a thick, rich liquid. Once it's all mixed together, we give it a bit more time to solidify and cook down a bit while we're waiting for our next phase of cooking on the soup, and then we add that to the big pot too. Now give it a good stir, partially cover, and cook for another 15 minutes so that everyone gets a chance to get to know each other. And there you have it, my version of bacon soup. Garnish over the top with freshly chopped parsley and maybe a dollop of sour cream. Now, normally how this works is if you'd like the exact recipe, you can go over to patreon.com slash charlatanwonder where all active patrons of $5 and up get access to everything. But after looking it over, I found that my version of the recipe was pretty close to the already existing recipe. And between that and how said recipe had a lot of gaps in it, I've decided to just release mine for free so that everyone can try it out if they're genuinely interested. It's got more clear instructions which I know it's a lot, but hopefully it's less intimidating because a lot of stuff that's hard about cooking is not knowing exactly what to do. There'll be plenty of recipes and coming videos for me to lure you into patronage with, but for now, let's get back to Bendy. Before we take a peek at the story, let's talk about something else that I'm probably not the first person to point out. The Meatly loves Bioshock. He might be the only person on this planet who loves Bioshock more than I do. If you know what to look for, there's little nods to System Shock at the bottom of the ocean all over the place. For starters, the targeting reticle in-game is very reminiscent of the first two Bioshock games reticle. You find yourself using a lot of things that are nods to Bioshock, like a syringe that you need to collect a special life essence from from those Seeker guys, or that good old pipe wrench. And finally, my personal favorite, it would seem that a Mr. F. Fontaine has business with Joey Drew. I wonder what a fishing magnate would need to talk to an animation CEO about. Uh, that joke makes more sense if you've read the Bioshock prequel novel. Yeah, I've been meaning to make a new Bioshock video for literal years now. Now, something that's a little less over is the inspiration that some of the characters in Bendy and the Ink Machine take from Bioshock. The one that sticks out to me the most is how Alice Angel is definitely harnessing some big Sandra Cohen energy. There's other smaller things, like how the man who designed the Bendy world is a tad reminiscent of Andrew Ryan in the matter of Pomp, but that's more on a surface level. There's a few areas that kind of physically remind me of Rapture 2, such as the entryway to Bendy's Toy Factory somewhat resembling the entryway to Rapture a bit. You know, that area you usually blaze through because all you've got up until that point is the wrench and Electro Bolt. And then there's how you're frequently dealing with flooded out areas, which while one is ink and the other is seawater, it's very much the aesthetic issue of when you're in a narrow hallway that you need to get to the end of, but it's completely submerged or blocked off by the force of the liquid. That's a bit more Bioshock 2 though. These make sense because Bioshock is heavily inspired by the Art Deco aesthetic, whereas Bendy is inspired by Rubber Hose Animation, two products of the 1920s which happened concurrently. Big blocky gears and grandeur were just things you put in everything back then, like 
Bacon in the early 2010s. One last thing that I'm gonna have a hard time showing since there's spoilers all over the place is the end of Game Museum that is very much reminiscent or outright inspired by Bioshock Infinite's end of Game Museum. And even if it isn't, this is the coolest thing ever and I wish more games would do it. You remember how we compared the Ink Demon to the Xenomorph a little while ago? Man, how great would it be if at the end of Alien Isolation, you were able to walk around in a little hangar and get a good look at the alien models with dev commentary? Now, the main reason I bring up all these little nods to the Bioshock franchise is because the Meatly et al. take the right inspiration from Bioshock. Less misquoting Ayn Rand and more antagonistic relationships with major plot characters, learning world building through exploration and audio diaries, and loving the daylights out of your subject matter. There's tons of spooky games that do gameplay well or have good scares, but what Bendy and the Ink Machine does is commit to the aesthetic and stylings of their concepts to make something genuinely unique. I am so happy that this game has a sequel, and on that note, I originally planned for this to be just one video of the whole Bendy series, but I enjoyed this game so much, I'm making a standalone video and doing another on the Dark Revival. Sorry Boris, I'll get to Dark Survival another time. Maybe Indie Ween. Okay, time for a little bit of premise and world building, and then we'll do the story proper. Just as a heads up, I'm not going to do any lore theories or anything else like that because, well, everyone else has done that for all the mascot horror games to the point where there's nothing else I can really add. The premise for Bendy and the Ink Machine is that you are one Harry, former animator and partner at Joey Drew Studios, who's received a message from Joey Drew himself to come back to the studio and see something he's created. Things are a little weird, though. Did the ink machine always make that much ink? Was it always that big? What the heck was that thing that chased us into the sound production area? I guess we'll have to get to the bottom of this if we want to know exactly what Joey wanted to show us. Okay, folks, spoiler warning. Get to that timestamp if you don't want them. So Harry goes down deeper into the animation studio after he turned on the ink machine to find that his creations have come to life in a not so good way and that the few members of the production team that are still around have been adversely affected by the ink. Take poor Sammy here who, if Alice is inspired by Sander Cohen, this guy's Dr. Steinman. Harry makes it past Sammy and makes friends with Boris, one of the characters from the Bendy cartoons. Turns out that unfortunately our Boris is one of many and Boris is our, I guess, cannon fodder in this world. Poor guy's a great source of whatever special Special Ink is used to make other entities deep within the studio, at least according to Alice Angel here. It's unclear if this is the spurned voice actress of Alice getting a little too into the role, or a warped interpretation of Alice Angel made with ink. We don't really have much time to think about that though, because she's preventing us from accessing a way out of this place, and has quite the list of things for us to do. Sidebar here, but despite being a small team in the team's first game at that, Benny and the Ink Machine has some really impressive facial animations. Sure, it's no VTMB, which somehow set the bar absurdly high way back in 2004, but the fact that they took the time for something like this, and it all matches up so well with the words and emotions the actors are portraying is wonderful. Additionally, the voice acting in this game is great. Everyone is professional and brings their A game. And like that one clip I showed you earlier, the acting in this game does an excellent job of selling the world. We run all of Alice's errands only for her to decide that she wants our Boris and betrays us. What a surprise. Now we need to scramble through what's frankly a pretty cool level filled with the remains of a botched theme park project to get to the haunted house where Boris is being kept just in time to see that Alice made a monster out of him. Poor guy can't catch a break. We take Boris to a farm of state, and before Alice can shift to lead us out of being upset of us destroying her creation, she learns that she can trust no one. Not even herself, as nice Alice, or later on known as Allison, shows up with cool Boris, who goes by Max. Alice is nice enough, but Max doesn't trust us at all, and when the Ink Demon is a-coming, he leaves us for dead, as he and Alice get out of Dodge. However, this neat little thing Allison gave us lets us find a path out of the prison cell Max put us in, where we confront Sammy again, and then help Max and Allison fight off waves and waves of those Seekers, and once we survive, Max thinks we're okay. Now that he's our friend, Max is a great problem solver. We finally learn that the way to stop the Ink Demon in all of this madness is to find a film reel titled The End, which will quite literally put an end to all this Ink Madness. But only if we find a way to show it to the Ink Demon. About him. Using the crazy Ink stuff, Joey Drew, with the help of an entity called the Gent Company, tried to create real, living versions of all the classic characters from the Bendy cartoons. That's how we get the Alice's, the Boris's, and all those record gangs. It says in an audio journal that despite all the research and production efforts into making these mascots real, they only ever attempted to make one Bendy. You know, the main character of the Bendy cartoons. 
Turns out that the ink demon is that bendy. They botched it so bad that instead of a cute little guy, we got this literal demon who sort of has the run of the place. We defeat him in another sign of the Meatly's good taste in a fight reminiscent of the Rhino from Neversoft Spider-Man before getting him into a position where Bendy is forced to watch the final animation reel. As Bendy is destroyed, we find ourselves briefly in the real world where Joey Drew himself has a chat with us and we're back in the animation studio. I guess we'll have to find out what's going on in the next game. Final thoughts on Bendy and the Ink Machine? It's great. I'm happy I came into it with an open mind. I think I'm a fan of the Bendy franchise now. It's not the most intense gaming experience you've ever played, but it's got a wonderful aesthetic, great voice acting, and animations, and thanks to those two and some fun easter eggs if you know what to look for, it's a great thing to play. There's also some secret stuff that I didn't find, but I've seen other people with, and mm, I don't think I'm hardcore enough for this, and I've got a lot of games to show you in the near future. Thanks to trying out this beginner's mindset, I was able to enjoy this despite the stigma some associate with mascot horror, and who knows? Maybe this won't be the only game commonly considered mascot horror that I'll turn out to like and enjoy quite a bit. I think there's at least one more that I'll have a nice time with. Remember that we've got a whole lot more videos are coming for Halloween in July, and with the celebration of Spookies, the Patreon is discounted as low as it'll let me discount it with cool free gifts for all the yearly pledges to boot. And I actually do make all of these aprons and patches by hand, and I'm hyped to start sending them out to you. If that's out of your price range right now, or you're just not feeling it, that's cool. If you want to help me out in another way, there's always doing those algorithm things. Now let's sign off. Remember that no matter what you do, be it classic animation, painting figurines, or anything else creative, what you do should never be called content. It is art. Content is a word that has been twisted into meaning a way to grind up all your skills, passions, and ideas into a gray sludge that has no greater purpose than to make a line go up for someone else's benefit, and your art in no way deserves that. Your art is an inalienably a reflection of you through the very act of its creation, and you are worth fighting for. So get out there and fight for your art by fighting against content. Stay saucy, everyone. What you inspect in there, sir? What is this? Who is that? Is it you? Okay, seriously, I need you to uh, get off. This is not sits. Do not sit. I'm trying to fold these. We gotta get these ready. Sir, 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 sir. Away with you. You know, yeah, you can sniff those. They're already folded. That I could compromise? Yeah, that's, that's you. Everybody's excited. But seriously, I got like 200 more of these to fold. Are you gonna help? It'd be great if you helped. I guess that's kind of helping.